Uh, good morning. Uh, good morning, everybody, and welcome to uh, CSIS. Uh, thanks for joining us today uh, for this event on the border crisis, immigration reform, and what we can expect moving forward. Uh, this is a Friday. It seems a bit casual, uh, and I think it's uh, the right sort of context. Uh, we've had you here, Doug, uh, so many times to talk about this issue. I think it's good to give continuity to this. It's still an issue that hasn't been resolved. Uh, you are the expert on the issue, and we're lucky uh, that you've accepted uh, coming regularly here to CSIS uh, to, to uh, give your views, impressions on this issue. As some of you probably remember, our last event of the summer uh, was on this issue as well. We hosted presidents of Guatemala and Honduras here at CSIS, and it was uh, or is uh, the first event here this fall because the issue still hasn't been dealt with. I'm thrilled to have Doug with me here today. As I mentioned, he's a senior associate uh, of the Americas program, uh, the president of IBI Consultants, a great friend of mine of the program, and I'm glad that he's here with us today. There's really no one better equipped to address these issues, and I know he'll be able to uh, provide exceptional insights uh, on this issue as well. But before we delve into the immigration and border uh, debate, I think we have to do a little to address uh, the context around what is happening uh, with regards to American foreign policy writ large at the moment. Uh, as you all know, on Wednesday night, President Obama addressed the nation, announcing his plans for addressing the growing threat of ISIS, the Islamic State uh, of Iraq and Syria, uh, and what threat this uh, poses to U.S. and global security. It was a foreign policy defining speech, one that I expect we'll see, we'll see uh, echoed in the actions orientation of this country's foreign policy for quite a while. I bring this up not as a distraction, but rather as uh, a point to remind us all of the environment we're currently facing uh, and operating in with regards to foreign policy issues, broadly speaking. With something so large, so pressing as US military involvement halfway around the world, combating a threat to global securities on the table. Uh, it can mean uh, that it's going to be harder for us to remember different issues, regional issues, in particular this issue uh, that we're talking about today, immigration uh, of Central American uh, children, unaccompanied children, but also the security implications involved with this and uh, what we deal with uh, at the border. Uh, so even with what's going on around the world, uh, this issue is still relevant. It's still important to uh, U.S. security and our prosperity. Uh, in reality, what we'd like to see or talk about today uh, is, is the policy side. Where does this issue stand um, in, in this greater context? Uh, this country has been long a destination for Latin American immigrants, especially those from Mexico and Central America. But the last 10 months have fundamentally changed the usual dynamics of immigration. We've seen over 60,000 unaccompanied alien children apprehended at the border for uh, fiscal year 14, double the number apprehended last year. And we've seen nearly five-fold increase in family unit apprehensions along the border this year as well. This issue is, frankly, huge. And we're, uh, when we still haven't dealt with the issue, we, we still haven't uh, found an effective way to mitigate it. Years overdue, immigration reform has been a topic of heated debate and sorely lacking compromise since the renewed push for reform last year, with senators and congressmen unable to see eye to eye on the future of U.S. immigration policy. The president's supplemental request for $3.7 billion in emergency funds to deal with the current crisis at the border languished in Congress with no compromise and thus no funding before lawmakers went on their August recess. The president has repeatedly suggested that he would use executive authority wherever possible to mitigate the crisis. And though the use of executive authority for these issues has uh, a long list of pros and cons all its own, he announced last week he would delay any action on immigration and border policy until after the midterm elections this November. Uh, this he, view, he viewed or he stated uh, was given political considerations and the potential impact of executive action on hotly contested uh, congressional seats. Uh, so this issue is still evolving. It still hasn't been dealt with. There's political issues uh, that are still, uh, I guess, becoming more the priority than dealing with the content and the substance of this issue. Uh, there was some talk uh, about dealing with this 
during the lame duck period this winter, but more and more it seems that that's unlikely to happen. Uh, if Republicans take control of the Senate, uh, some speculate that they'll have little incentive to compromise during the lame duck. If Democrats hold on to the Senate, Republicans will be motivated to dig in while they still can. Uh, so prospects aren't great for resolving this issue in the short term. Um, our government's inability to come together on this issue speaks to their own deep political uh, divisions, uh, not to the true importance of this issue. Uh, I'll leave it to Doug to talk about the other issues, uh, root causes of this problem, which I believe are the sort of overwhelming reason why we should be dealing with this. I just wanted to sort of frame the issue um, in the broader foreign policy context. There's also a domestic imperative here. Uh, the fact that demographics are changing here in the United States is also very important in this discussion. Uh, as difficult as Americans appear to find compromising on immigration reform, uh, over 17% of Americans identify themselves as Hispanic or Latino, and by, mid, uh, by the mid-21st century, that figure is expected to double. So this issue is a international and a domestic issue, and uh, if we don't deal with it now, we're gonna have to deal with it uh, eventually. Uh, so fixing these problems is long overdue, and, and, and Doug has the answers. Uh, <laughs> So I'm, I'm going to leave it to Doug. Um, I'm going to turn it over to him. He's going to give us his views on where the issue is right now. And hopefully, we'll be able to have a, a lively uh, chat about these issues, touching on the core issues, and hopefully fill in some voids on, on questions that you might have as well. So without further ado, Doug, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Carl. And thank you for that uh, very generous introduction. And thank you for, for coming. I think the, one of the things uh, Coming, going back and forth to Central America a lot these days uh, is, is watching the Central Americans watch us and our inability to deal with things that we keep demanding that they deal with on policy issues. And, and, and the, the, the disconnect is not lost on them. The fact that we can't come up with a policy while we're beating them on the heads to come up with policies themselves that mitigate circumstances uh, is, I think, a... Uh, a, a real problem and a problem of perception that makes their willingness, uh, especially in the Northern Triangle, the willingness of those governments to take serious action even less than it, than it was originally, be, initially because they don't see anything happening on, on, our end of the, on our end of the show either. And the other thing I just find really striking uh, is how completely uh, this issue fell off the agenda as soon as, the, as soon as it fell off the front pages. It just, as soon as it stopped being written about, it disappeared. And uh, you know, on the ground, yes, there are fewer unaccompanied minors coming. The dynamics have shifted a little bit, but the fundamental problems are all still there. And as soon as people could stop talking about it, they did, which was really striking to me as, 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 a, as, a, as a driver of policy. And I think that partly explains why uh, both the administration and Congress stopped talking about it as soon as they could because it's, nobody wants to deal with a very uh, prickly issue. But I think that you know, going forward, you have to look, if you look at with the dynamics driving Central America, none of them are better either. And I think if you, if you look across the region, uh, none of the countries in the Northern Triangle are, are making particularly serious efforts. Mexico has agreed to start doing some things which would push the, which would keep some of the uh, traffic further south instead of getting into Mexico and then into the United States. But it, one of the things, and I was talking with uh, some folks who are up from El Salvador uh, last night who monitor these issues, one of the things that's really, I think, will make exacerbate the problem, and one of the things that those countries have not gotten a handle on is the consolidation of the territorial control of the gangs. And if you look at uh, these guys who deal with uh, on the security level, a uh, more official level at the gang issue, we're talking about how for the first time, they're seeing the gangs exercise in parts of, uh, of El Salvador serious territorial control, not in the sense that they just control it like they've always done. The cliques have controlled the comunas and, and they find people. They're setting up their own judicial systems. They're telling people, they're setting up their own public transportation systems and not letting the buses in. They're using, they're running their own pickup trucks and, and their own buses back and forth. They've always been involved in the transportation business and, uh, and, uh, extorting the transportation business. Now they're going into the business themselves in a different way. They're, uh, they're doing a whole series of governance things that they hadn't done before, which to me speaks to the consolidation of those 
groups, and it's not, it's not all of the cliques everywhere doing this, but there are specific cliques in specific parts of El Salvador which have generally been the leading cliques on how the rest of the gang goes. And so I think that, that the, as, as that happens and as the rule of law continues to disintegrate, I think the, the Santa Seren government in El Salvador has been very slow off the mark on the security issues. The Benito Lara, they're, they're the Minister for Public Security, uh, from outside at least gives in from the people who work with him, uh, who I was talking to, it seems to be way over his head. He's, he's not, doesn't understand, they didn't, the FMLN went into this as if they didn't realize the gangs were gonna be a problem, which is rather striking because it was the issue of the campaign and that, you know, uh, it, it, they, didn't seem, they didn't seem to actually think about it getting into office much. And I think you see the same thing in Honduras. I think Guatemala is a little more coherent in trying to come up with a strategy that may not uh, adhere to the rule of law as much as one would like, but a strategy nonetheless. Uh, Honduras, I think, uh, is learning, has learned very well how to speak a language that the policy people in Washington understand and like because it sounds very much like we'd like to hear, but I don't think there's much substance to it. So I, I think across the region, the, those pro the problems that you see are, are getting worse, the driving factors are getting worse, exacerbated, and there's very little engagement except for the for initially, you know, Biden goes to Guatemala, we do a few things, and as soon as, and, and then the engagement essentially stops. And there's some new, uh, one, of the, one of the things that I was reading last night, the, the Woodrow Wilson Institute has put out a new ser two new papers on the, the CARSI in mm -hmm. uh, Guatemala and Honduras, and is, none of it's very optimistic. I mean, the, pro the pro programs we have put a lot of money into are not producing the results that one expect or had hoped for going in. So I think there are a series of things that haven't changed or are getting worse, and, and I think the, the danger on the Washington side is we're pretending like we didn't have the first crisis and that, or that things are resolved <laughs> and moving forward when essentially everything's either stagnant uh, or worse. So I think, I think the panorama is not overly optimistic, and as you said, the chances of actually moving on this end are relatively slim. So. But how bad do you think this can get if it's left unattended? Um, I mean, it, it, lots of questions come up. Is this an issue of improving on the frameworks that we already have, or is this uh, an issue also of addressing or adding more issues or more ways of dealing with this issue uh, in a broader sense. So is, is, is CARSI good enough uh, to do that, uh, or do we have to sort of reinvent this policy? I, I hate to talk about reinvention because that's a long-term process, mm -hmm. but I do think that we essentially have to reinvent. I mean, I, I mean my, and I think we've, we've talked about it, at least privately you and I have talked about this. I think if you look at the money that's gone into CARSI in the last three or four years, by every metric, the countries receiving the car seat money are in worse shape than they were when mm -hmm. the money started going in, in terms of homicide rates, incarceration rates, overcrowding, impunity, uh, judicial reform, all of those things are worse. So I think that if you spend a significant amount of money and you see the opposite results of what you're expecting, you don't continue the same policy, <laughs> right? That, but, I, but, it, but that calls into question, I mean, my, my fundamental and what, I, what I've, uh, written about and what we talked about in the past. I, th I think that the governance issues for the governments of the Northern Triangle are so dire that you essentially have governments that are no longer either the strongest force in their countries, uh, don't have the political will to take on these things, or so corrupted from inside in so many different ways it makes it impossible to deal with them. So I think the, to me that one of the huge issues is who are the interlocutors that you could engage with as the U.S. government, if you want, to, if you want to support re true reform efforts, and I think to me that is the huge challenge, mm -hmm. uh, because it, you know you, we have, I think, improving police in El Salvador. I think one thing that the FMLN has done is brought back uh, some of the better police that have been purged out in the, the end of the Funes government. Uh, I think you have uh, a few signs of, of progress where you, where you could work, but generally you, the police as institutions in all the three countries are not pr very reliable. Mm -hmm. uh, the new studies on CARSI were talking about the inability of the vetted units to do what they were intended to do over time. I've been a big proponent of vetted units. I found that very disheartening <laughs> to read how the vetted units uh, were, were not doing that. The judiciary structures are completely non-functional in all three countries. 
and the corruption is massive, and there's no indication or very little indication of the political will of those governments to tackle those issues writ large. And until there is that, I'm not sure where we would be putting money into yeah. on a policy level. So it's a framework. It's a framework. Um, and if we don't deal with these issues, if, if, if uh, this sort of inability from Washington continues, um, what will we be facing? Will it be more kids coming over, or is it general erosion of governments in Central America and then just them being taken over by different elements, different security threats? I would say probably both. I think that what the driving factors there, and if you, you know, if you, like in places like San Pedro Sula or places around, uh, in certain parts of San Salvador, uh, around uh, the communes around, the communities around San Salvador, the violence is, is it's really, they really are war zones. And these kids really, I mean, one of the things that the FML, or not that the FML, the gangs have been doing across the region is essentially shutting down schools. Mm -hmm. You're losing your, what little education systems there were because they begin extorting in the schools when they're 11, 12 years old, they take over the schools and then kids just stop going. They flee or they're incorporated into gangs, they stop going. So the, mul the, the factor, the sort of the multiplication factors internally as these types of things proliferate in, for the countries are horrendous. The long-term consequences are really, and those are the kids, those, you know, a lot of those ones are the ones that want to come to the United States. They can't live there anymore. Uh, they're, they're desperate and they're coming a, a, across the border. So I think as things get worse there, I think, there's a, I think what we're seeing now, this is my sense, is this little pause where we said, no, 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 don't come. And the government said, no, 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 don't come. And so people said, well, okay, but you know, it's not gonna last for very long because the situation there is, is gonna get, is getting worse and those same factors will be pushing people, and I think we're going to see another, an ongoing, another wave. Another, another wave. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of folks talk about the different roles uh, that neighboring countries can play. Uh, most importantly, the role that Mexico can play in dealing with this issue. How would you assess that? Um, has it been a, from what you know and what you hear and conversations that you've had with, with other uh, officials, um, are they doing all that they can do to um, sort of work with us on some of these issues with the United States? Are they doing what they need to do on their southern border? Uh, do they deal with the potential security problems that sort of this flow, uh, unchecked flow of people could present not only to the United States but also their immediate concern, which is Mexico? Right. What kind of job are they doing? Well, I, th I think you know one of the things that's I think policy and, and a lot of people uh, in the U.S. don't understand is that that's none of none of that migration is viewed as illegal down there. It's a normal way of life, and it's not particularly uh, nobody thinks, oh my God, people are moving through. They, you know, they move through for a long, long time, and they're going to keep moving through again. So it's it, the the sense of alarm I think that's coming from Mexico is they're seeing a significant strengthening of the alliances between the Central American gangs and like the Barrio Aztecas and Doblados and things on their border, which is, which is a security problem mm -hmm. for them. And as the gangs take over, have taken over some of the main uh, human movement routes, then they're seeing this ability of these groups to com combine uh, lessons learned and, and form up in ways that they hadn't before. And that is, a, I think, from their point of view, significant. So that's gotten their attention. Uh, and I think that we have been asking them to do a lot at a time when they're doing a lot of other things. And so it's not a high priority for them. Mm -hmm. And it's not, uh, it's just not culturally something you do. You don't, you don't stop migrants from going through Mexico, right? It's just you've never had to do that before. So I think that they're doing more and they're putting some resources in there, but they're also in the middle of a rather significant political transformation mm -hmm. of, their, of their own. Uh, I think that as the criminalized elements and as the gang elements become more visible and more uh, a, a real threat to them, that, you'll, that they are taking more measures and assessing that. And mm -hmm. they're talking a lot for the little bit that I know of one of the first times with the Colombians a lot about yeah. how to handle this type of, of uh, relationship between criminal organizations that are now spreading. But I don't think that they have a huge interest in stopping migrants Mm -hmm. just because we would like them mm -hmm, to. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We've had conversations sort of, um, you know, not, not public ones, uh, about the different threats within Central America. And over lunch, I remember, uh, we talked about a specific area in Central America where there seems to be a lot 
of traffic, uh, border areas between countries. Um, do these countries have the, uh, the capacity or capability to deal with these threats, how they've presented themselves in their countries? Uh, do they deal with, for instance, I mean, there's a lot of border conflict uh, or a lot of areas on the border that are unattended by governments. All right. Uh, what in the short term will be able to be done to deal with that? Is that possible in the short term? Um, where do you see that sort of the outgrowth of that problem going? Um, well, I don't think it's possible in the short term, and I'm not sure. I'm not sure that's something they should spend a lot of time on. Okay. Primarily because I think that unless there is, at least in the Northern Triangle, I would say all of Central America, a common vision of what they should be doing, trying to control each country, trying to control the individual border, is not going to matter much okay. because. Uh, the, the spaces are so small, and you have such you know centuries of people moving across these artificial borders and smuggling stuff back and forth. Um, and I think you know one of the huge issues again is the is just as illegal uh, people we consider illegal migrants moving across that they don't consider abnormal or illegal. Uh, the the smuggling of goods and services across in a lot of the most border areas is viewed as perfectly licit. Mm -hmm. they, in their mind, they are the licit ones in the state, if it were to try to stop them, are illicit actors for taking their livelihood away. Mm -hmm. So it's a very different uh, perspective. I think, I think what the, the, the greater, much more effective would be to have a common vision and a common protocol for pursuing gangs, uh, we know that the Sina, some of the Sinaloa folks, if, you, the, if they're discovered in Salvador, will be in Honduras within two hours. And, and, uh, and it doesn't matter what you do on the actual border, even if you're doing, dealing with the uh, Punto Ciegos, you know, they'll fly. They'll go, I mean, you, there, there's no way to stop that movement in that small an area, these people going back and forth. So I would say that one of the things we, that we really need to engage in, and what I don't think we have engaged in, is trying to come up with a joint, coherent policy in which all three countries can buy into on shared security, on, on threats that they agree are threats to all three nations, and that they have a, an agreement on how to uh, deal with them. If they're, you know, can you do hot pursuit across the border? Can you have a, a truly, and they've talked about this and never done it, a uh, multi national, meaning Northern Triangle, uh, force that could then act in all three countries mm -hmm. on certain issues, uh, narcotics trafficking, uh, gangs, human smuggling, if, especially if it's the Chinese or other groups coming through where they make a lot more money than they do on Central Americans, et cetera. And none of that has really gotten off the ground, but we don't seem to be thinking about it in that, those terms. I'm going to turn it over to folks in the, in the audience for questions. I know from my staff that we have some tweeted questions, so let me start with those, and then we'll get to uh, some questions from, from the audience. Um, in response to your comments on the political will of the Central American governments, one of our followers asked, the Central American presidents were here in July. What came of those meetings? Oh, I, it's, it, from what I can tell, the sort of they fell into a great vacuum. You know, there, there was not a lot of follow-up uh, they all agreed it was a major problem. We said, please help, and they said, okay, and then everybody went home and went about their business, and then we went back to Iraq, and they went back to their sort of local issues. So that's what I was talking about, the, the lack of sustained engagement on a senior policy level with senior policy folks down there as a, as a, as a multiple countries, not individual countries, I think has, has not been followed through on. Any questions here? In the front here. Hi, I'm Jessica Barrett from the Pan American Development Foundation. Um, two questions. One, you mentioned the need to find the trusted interlocutors for the U.S. government. Could you talk a little bit about, in your experience, who those interlocutors might be? Are they local government officials? Like, where, at which level are we looking at? Um, and then also, Thinking about the private sector and the role that they played in, for example, Mexico and Juarez and Monterrey, do you see any similar types of engagement with the private sector in any of these three countries? Any opportunities to form these kinds of coalitions yeah. around violence, um, or is is the trust just not there at all? I, I, you know, I think the last, the second question is really important on the private sector and, and why they're not engaging more because they're they're not. 
Um, and I, I think that that is one of the, it's, it's, and, I, and I do it as much and more, maybe more than most. I'm very, I think one can make very harsh assessments about what the government has and has not done. But I think I, I often don't, uh, and I think talk about the private sector and what they could and should do and what they're not doing, which is I think equally, uh, is is it's uh, frenando stopping the process from going forward, right? They're not willing, and and there there are reasons for it, um, historic and I think current reasons. And it's very hard, for example, in El Salvador, to attract investment or get people to put more money into businesses when the gangs are con are constantly expanding and they can't move their people safely back and forth to factories. And when you have across the region huge amounts of narco money now coming in and undercutting legitimate businesses as they as they go into the laundering business in ever more sort of serious ways and you know if you're if you're a narco and you you want to set up a business and you don't care if you make a profit because you're just laundering money and you can take a 10% loss you're going to put the private sector out of business fairly quickly and they're doing that as they as we saw them do in at a certain phase in Colombia they hit the same the same uh, dynamic. So there are reasons, but I, but I think there's also in, in Central America a historic tendency of the really uh, rich in the business class to just sort of walk away or to come back to Miami and just sort of pack up. And I mean, a couple of years ago, I don't know what the current statistics were, but in 2000, I think it was 2012 or 2013, the private sector in El Salvador created 1,000 new jobs. That is like the most pathetic thing you can, you can think of, right? I mean, that, that 1,000 new jobs, um, there's, there's very little uh, willingness to assume risk. And then you do have the, all these other real risk factors. The first question was on the interlocutors. Um, I think it's very difficult to find. And I mean, I think you know, every once in a while, someone like Claudia Pasipas comes along in Guatemala, everybody gets on board. You know, the, we're there, the EU's there, she's making documentable progress. And she gets too close to certain interests, and boom, she's gone. Uh, despite what we wanted, despite what the EU wanted, despite what the United Nations, you know, everybody was on board to uh, supporting her and her team. It was, certainly wasn't just her. And then suddenly she, you know, it, that's not enough. So that, gave, that case actually gave me a lot of pause because I thought, okay, here was one person that we, everyone could agree on that that was a, something that was making a significant uh, Dent in impunity in uh, their you know, case were actually being tried cases were actually they're actually being getting convictions they had a whole team set up to do uh, different things within the fiscalia and it was really quite impressive and all the international support was not enough to keep them from knocking her out when they wanted to knock her out um, which goes which then to me demonstrates how incredibly difficult it is to get to the real root cause of this of uh, to real change because she was okay as long as she was more or less not touching mm. core interests. <laughs> and then she was touching core interests and that was the end of that. And you don't say, and what's the, what's the message to everyone else who might ever want to do that? Don't, <laughs> right, just don't. So I think that's why I think the, the problem is so real. There are NGOs, but then you have the same problem you have in Iraq and elsewhere. If you're only funding the non-government agencies instead of strengthening government institutions, you're also not getting at the core Thing, but you can't trust the government, so you're, it's a very difficult s series of choices. Up here. Good morning, great talk. Um, Sergio de la Peña, independent consultant. How is it that we don't get more information on where these kids are going? Uh, I know that, for example, in the state of Virginia, there are easily over 2,000 children that have been dropped off. In Texas, I believe that number is somewhere in the vicinity of over 4,000. And there's a lack of transparency by the federal government in its relations with the state government and letting know where these kids are going. And as such, they're being expedited through the screening process for health issues. Uh, so the first question is why, are they so, wh wh why do we have such a lack of transparency? And the second one is can you address the potential repercussions of having some of these children get through that aren't properly screened and then later you end up in a situation where you could have somebody carrying uh, some sort of communicable disease uh, that could be tied to them. You know, for example, in the Midwest right now, there's a, there's a pulmonary virus or fungus or some sort of bacteria that's going around that's making kids sick. And just to, you know, just to give you a little anecdote, I went and assisted the Chilean uh, Carabinero 
attache here in Washington to get his kid into Fairfax County school systems. I went through all sorts of, of loops trying to accommodate the requirements that Fairfax County had to get this person who's here on diplomatic status into school, and it took about two weeks because they had to go back to Chile, get a whole slew of, of vaccinations that they had given to this child in her medical records. They had to be translated, then they had to be submitted, and the parents went through all these nut rolls. But yet, here you have a situation where these kids are being put into school. Now, the word on the street is that they're using things such as the homeless laws so that they can get around some of these things, and it's creating a terrible mess, especially with county, and, uh, county school systems that have to do a budget, and now all of a sudden they're being overwhelmed. Um, unfortunately, it's not something I know much about. Right. Uh, I, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know why there's lack of transparency. I, I haven't dealt with it on, on the U.S. side. Um, so I, I, don't, I, I don't know how that system is supposed to work and how, is, and how it's actually working. As for the kids coming across, um, you know, I think that there, there probably are some uh, health issues and things. I, and I don't know what the process is if you come from a country and you want to put your kid in here and you're not a, and you're not a U.S. citizen into the, into the school system because I, I haven't had to deal with that. I mean, I would I would guess. I mean, I know that there is some screening and stuff going going on. I, I know that is when we talked we talked about this earlier. I mean, I understand the concern about overwhelming local resources by the amount of kids coming in or people coming in uh, that somebody is going to have to pay for some of the systems have to absorb. <laughs> And I, and I understand that that, uh, that causes a great deal of anxiety and, and anger in some communities that, that they have a lot. Um, and to me, that's what makes it such a difficult problem because I also understand from, the, from down there why these kids are coming up and why, what, the, what the significant uh, push factors are for them when, when you decide, you know, and I don't think it's an easy decision for, for any parent anywhere no matter what the relationship is like, to send their kid on that kind of a journey just because, I mean, everybody, given the history of all of the migration, everybody knows what that trip is like. And it's not fun, and no 12-year-old should be ever, you know, asked to do that. So it's a measure of the absolute desperation when you see these kids coming up. So I, I can, that's why I think it's such a difficult problem to solve, because you have two really important uh, Things to add to, to weigh to weigh out, and how that weighs out is 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 really difficult. So I, I don't know about the kids with, with disease and stuff. I I'm not, you know I don't know under transparency. I'm not sure. And, and another thing on, on, on that issue, um, you know, I'm, I'm sure that there are children who have who are sick, uh, uh, but it doesn't represent or, or isn't um, representative of the overwhelming majority of the kids. And I think it's when these discussions occur, uh, I think we have to sort of walk a fine line and not sort of labeling right. these children as, as being sort of uh, vessels of, um, of sicknesses or illnesses. I, I think the issues that you raised are important ones. Overwhelming local governments is an important issue. We wouldn't want uh, folks to be expedited and then find out that they had a terrible disease. So I think it's important to be able to do those things. It's just that within the context of this discussion that is so heated, um, labeling um, all of these kids based on what you might find with a couple is, is something that you want to be careful with. I'm not saying that you're doing that, but I just I, I think that it's uh, important to sort of mention that in, 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 the, uh, in the discussion, which makes me think about another issue as well, which is, who's coming in and where they're going, which I think was your, was your original question. And we know that there's folks that are coming because they're running away from violence. We know that there are folks that are coming because they feel that there'll be a better economic opportunity in the United States, looking for a better life. But we also know that there's folks that might be infiltrated that have to do with the Maras. Uh, and we also know that, um, and I want to get your reaction to this, um, and, you know, when I used to work on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, we always used to talk about that they would use the same ways of coming in, that people would come in for labor uh, or uh, for different issues to the United States, people that weren't interested in harming the U.S., but that the bad guys in, in, in 
coordination with the Maras could use those same ways of getting into the United States to do bad things. And my question to you is now within this big framework of ISIS, of uh, heightened concerns of terrorism again coming back in Europe and in the United States, are the Maras likely to be um, uh, to take advantage of opportunities or interested in opportunities to work with international terrorist organizations? They know how to get into the United States. They are willing to do all kinds of things, as we've discussed, trafficking of people, illicit, uh, trafficking of illicit goods. Would they be willing or interested, uh, or could we foresee a scenario when Maras are working together with international uh, terrorist organizations to get something into the United States? Well, I, I, don't, I certainly don't think we've seen that okay. yet. Uh, what, what it, what's clear to me is that the Maras have a very clear idea of how the asylum system works and how to uh, take advantage of it and, and that they use it. Now, is it the vast majority or even a small percent? I don't know what percent of them do, but in talking with them, they, they, they have a strategy of taking advantage of this influx, uh, uh, this, this, this wave that was coming in. Not Probably not huge numbers of them, but they're, they're aware of it, they know how it works and all. Who they, they, the, the Maras, I think, for dealing with other groups outside of themselves yeah. is very difficult for them because their primary loyalty and identification is to the Mara, uh, to their clica and then to the Mara. Um, you're already hearing reports of conflicts between other groups coming in, particularly Russian organized crime, uh, groups try, coming into the region, running up against the Maras and not being able to work, reach out any sort of a, agreement with them. Because they're, they're very, and, and you know, if, you, if you look at how they deal with like the transportistas and the Sinaloa cartel, mm -hmm. it's, it's specific clicas that have territory that those, that those particular groups need to get to. Nobody goes looking to, for, to work with the Maras because they're nice people, because they're not. Uh, you know, it's not, you don't, search them out as right. your things. And I think that there is a, a strong understanding that unless you have overwhelming force that you can call on against them, that they will kill you in a heartbeat as soon as it's, it's their advantage. So I, I don't think, I think that the much more worrisome would be the traditional coyote networks, uh, the Sinaloa related, uh, Seta related groups that, that move, uh, particularly large numbers of Chinese that they move now. Um, and what they call Chinese, they may be multi multiple other nationalities. They, they, a lot of what they call the Hindus, which are folks from the Indian subcontinent, although they never look at their passports, they don't actually know what country they're from. They say, oh, the Hindus and the Chinese. Um, <laughs> great, great breakdowns. It doesn't tell you much, but except that there are a lot of them coming. And that those networks are used to moving people who are not like themselves mm -hmm. across the border. Mm -hmm. The Madas uh, tax things. They have their own networks to move themselves, um, as far as I know. But to, to sit down and negotiate with them to do something where they would be a reliable partner would be very difficult. Okay. Let me take some more questions. Are there more questions? Gentlemen in the back here, your glasses. Guillermo Cespedes, um, currently with Creative Associates. I until recently was the uh, deputy mayor of Los Angeles in charge of their gang strategy. So this is an issue that I've been tracking for many years. First of all, thank you for your fresh perspective on Central America watching us watch them. <laughs> haven't heard that before, and um, I think it's, it's really um, kind of on the button. Uh, my question is this, over the years it appears to me that this evolved or has evolved into a transnational issue, but it seems that the term transnational is used exclusively in relation to law enforcement. Do you think this new framework that you think may have to evolve would include a transnational approach that was more balanced, that included social programs as well as law enforcement? Because we are now dealing with a transnational family structure as it relates to right. Central America. So transnationalism is not just in relation to crime, it's in relation to other social programs. So is this something that you could see emerging as a potential framework for looking at this issue because it's not, it's a back and forth problem, especially right. with LA. Right. Um, some of, you know, history suggests that some of these issues, both Maras were born in Rampart. Right. 
and, and it's not popular, but we did export them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so at some point, it, it seems to me that, uh, do you think that lens is shiftable? Can we start looking at this problem as a transnational issue rather than an issue of Central America? Mm. That's an interesting question. I think, yeah, I mean, I think one of the, the huge things, as, as you well know, is the, is the trans family uh, issue, right? You have people down there, and and you have uh, a tradition of coming and going as well. And it's particularly before this this last wave. I think from 2008 to 2012, the number of people going back was more than the people coming into the country. You had this this imbalance, you know, but not imbalance. It was it, it was economics, right? We had a recession. They were they were going back home. So I think it's a very uh, I think, it's, I think it's very relevant. Uh, whether, can it be shifted? I don't know. Uh, should it be, the, the problem, I, the, I keep going back in my own mind to the issue that you can't have, it's very difficult to have three individual policies for three different countries down there, each country being so small, but having, a, you know, uh, but having a large number of people in this country. It has to be regional or it just can't really work, in my mind. And so I, I think the, that's to me the, the great, if you had a consensus down there as to what the issues were, working with some consensus up here, which we also don't have in between the president and the Congress among different parties, et cetera, then you could probably begin to discuss in much more depth what the factors are and how to get at them. But as long as you have uh, at, at least three strategies on the ground down there, and three strategies up here, all of which make six <laughs> strategies that don't overlap very much in any way, it's very difficult to imagine coming to a, a paradigm shift. Let me get a question from the audience here. There's a, a woman over here on the, on the left. Thank you. My name is Catherine Mungin. I had a question about the regional strategy. My understanding is that the push factors in Honduras and El Salvador are largely crime and um, homicide issues like that. In Guatemala, there's also uh, the source of migration is you see it more in rural areas with a lot of poverty. If that's true, how does that affect a regional three country strategy when we're seeing push factors differ from country to country to a certain extent? Also, um, you hear a lot about our success in Colombia leading to this problem in the Northern Triangle. With that in mind, to what extent should Panama, Nicaragua, and Costa Rica be involved in a regional strategy? Well, I think the, the second question, I, mean, I think the answer is a great deal. Because I, I, I mean, I don't, I'm not sure I buy, I, th I think the, what's happening in Mexico has much more to do with what's happening in Central America. I don't view, the Colombia piece is is particularly having a huge impact and because I mean, Colombia is still export. I mean, most of it, a lot more goes out through Venezuela and Ecuador than it used to. But it, I think that that's still the, the I think it's still the FARC and other groups that, that produce. Um, so I, I but I do think that the one thing that Colombia did show with the uh, the Plan Colombia with with significant problems that addressed it was that the political will mattered. And once, when Colombia developed its own internal uh, political will to deal with its multiple factors, and there was something there to support, uh, not only the United States, but a lot of other countries, then were, had stepped in, and, and, and you had, I think, in, relative, in terms of a very complex situation, a relatively successful program. Uh, and I think that that key factor on the political will is what's missing in Central America. Um, if you look, because I was living in Colombia during the, the end of the Medellin cartel into the Cali cartel and the paramilitares and all that stuff, was going on. it was a mess. I mean, I, and it was a, but the one, the other thing that, that made Colombia, I think, uh, doable besides having really intelligent people on their side and some pretty intelligent people on our side was it was one country. You were dealing with one government doing one thing in one space. You have all these different countries. But I do think that the bleed, bleed over factor from the Northern Triangle South into Panama and Costa Rica. Nicaragua, I think, has, is different because it has a very coherent internal structure that makes it more difficult to, and, and frankly, because they're much less democratic than the other two countries, they can do things more quickly than, Co Costa Rica is very slow to react because it goes through a democratic process and has a Congress that actually matters, whereas Ortega doesn't have to worry about that particularly. So he can, they can speed up their reaction times. 
Uh, so, I, so I, but yes, I think that I think the spillover factor or chances of spilling over, and you are, you already see it to a degree, certainly in Costa Rica, more than any place else, uh, in my experience. So I, I think that they should be. If you could get a seven-country consensus on what mattered, so much the better. But I think trying for three is hard. Trying for seven may not be. Uh, but I think they should certainly be involved in the discussions. I think that you know the idea that. Uh, is not going to affect them is nonsense, especially if there were any success in the Northern Triangle, they would pay the price immediately. So, yeah. 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 Uh, Ambassador Misto. Uh, uh, thank you. John Maestro, I'm a retired U.S. diplomat uh, with a lot of experience in the region. Kind of a follow up question uh, that links to U.S. policy. Um, your old newspaper, the, the, the Washington Post, had an editorial not long ago calling for a plan Colombia for, for the Northern Triangle. Um, do you, could you analyze that from the Washington perspective? And Carl, if you could jump into that as well. Speaking of political will, mm -hmm. is there any political will uh, around here to do something like that to respond to a real world crisis which affects uh, the United States to some measurable degree. Do you want me to start? Give you a little break. Um, so I can I can sort of um, theorize a little bit based on my experience in the legislative branch. The legislative branch, as you know, doesn't make foreign policy, but can be helpful and also can be a nuisance. Um, right now, or I would say, the last time that we went through something similar regarding a large sort of framework policy towards the region was the Merida Initiative. Uh, and that was 2000, 2007, 2008, towards sort of the end of, of the Bush administration and the implementation of that started uh, with President Obama. Um, it was very difficult at that time because of the definition of the problem. Uh, we were talking about uh, our ability to strengthen the government of Mexico to deal with the problems that existed in Mexico, strengthening the judicial branch, strengthening uh, their ability to deal with some of these security threats, their presence all over Mexico. Uh, it was something that was in the making a decade before, as you know, Ambassador, Ambassador Maisto, uh, close relationship that um, was sort of evolving between the military and the Department of Defense was key to being able to move on the Merida Initiative. Um, right now, um, it seems that there is a willingness in the executive branch of the United States government uh, that is not matched by the uh, context and environment that you see in the legislative branch. The legislative branch uh, is of two minds on this issue. One sees purely a security issue, and they have one way of dealing with the security issue, which has to do with you know, impediments and strengthening the border to deal with these issues. And then you have other folks that are, uh, might look at this more as an immigration issue. Um, I think both sides sort of have a point, but uh, I have not seen a sort of critical mass of both parties talk about dealing with the root causes of this issue. So until we can sort of get on board uh, an agreement on some of the issues that make up this conversation uh, and, that, uh, and, and not just wedded to an ideological sort of uh, uh, perception of what the problem is, I think it's going to be very difficult to move forward. We're also entering into a, um, an election framework, election year framework, presidential election year. Uh, which is going to start much earlier because of, of issues having to do with uh, the need to raise money, et cetera, et cetera. To do big things uh, because they will have a sort of uh, the, the potential for political fallout, which you won't be able to control one way or another. So that's another challenge that you're going to face in this issue. Um, uh, this is one of those intermestic issues. You know, it has the domestic and international side to it. The uh, domestic side is because you have such a large or, or a growing constituency of folks that are um, uh, that originate from the region. 
are also American, and they vote. So there's that side of it. Uh, it's international in scope for all the reasons that, that Doug mentioned. Uh, and the security imperative is one uh, of the issues that makes this up. Uh, but at the end of the day, um, you know, and you know this better than anyone, there's a long history that the United States has in this area, in the, in, in the region, going back to the wars uh, in the 80s and at the beginning of the 90s, um, and that, you know, we have this close relationship with this region. Perspective, it just seems sort of disturbingly strange that we wouldn't be able to, on the foreign policy merits, come to some sort of consensus to deal with these issues. Uh, we have the contacts, we have the relationships. Uh, you know, that to me is, is bizarre. Um, we're in a conversation now, and this is sort of the, the issue that's um, been out there for a while, which is, deal with a lot of these issues. I think that probably people would be more likely to deal with uh, or to be acceptant of the use of, uh, of executive authority to deal with the crisis, but not to deal with a long-term policy solution to the problems that we're facing. Uh, but these problems aren't going away, yeah. uh, and uh, things are going to worsen. And the question is, is how bad do things have to get before uh, the legislative branch and the executive branch can deal with this issue. That it's not going away. That, that would sort of be my, uh, my comment from, from the legislative branch. Um, I used to work for Dick Luger. Dick Luger was an internationalist that believed firmly in bipartisan governance. I believe in the same thing. Um, I hope that you know we're able to see the same sort of situation or something like it after the uh, after the fall elections but I'm not but I'm a bit negative on on uh... Man, I, yeah I don't have any much to add. I think one of the real, truly extraordinary things about the about Pan Colombia was that it went from Clinton through Bush through you know through uh, Obama which is and the results are you can are measurable and in, in they're there and you can you can see that um, but I'm not sure that's replicable yeah. in the current environment. Yeah. Nor am I sure the countries down there would know what to do with it. If uh, I'm not sure the countries down the Northern Triangle countries are in a position where they could assume the responsibility decided that they really want to do this. I mean, one of the things that uh, when Carl and I were doing the Columbia report that I, uh, you know, I was really struck by, and I've, I think I mentioned this last time, at no point in Plan Colombia did the United States provide more than 24% of their military budget, and by the end it's down to 4%. I mean, the Colombians put an enormous amount in, and that is not something that is replicable in Central America right now. They owned it. There's the, you know, the Colombians that owned it. So. Any other which I think we, we, <laughs> we, we tried to, to answer. Is there, are there any other questions uh, from the audience? Sir? Right now, the numbers that are coming in um, are... They've gone up from, let me see, between January and July those numbers are around 47,000, uh, I'm sorry, 54,000, and the projections are about 90,000. The numbers are down right now because of the weather, but do you see, a, do you see those numbers actually reaching 90,000 now that the weather's getting nicer and they're gonna go into the fall season and everything is gonna, the conditions are gonna change to improve that? It's, it's Northern Triangle countries to say don't come. I think that we've tried to send the message don't come. I, I think that for a variety of reasons we might be in a pause for for a while. Um, partly because a lot of people spent a lot of money and didn't, you know, get the results they wanted with that money. With and people have been deported back, which uh, then make people said, oh well, you know. And, and I think there there is some understanding that a lot of this whole dynamic, the timing of this dynamic, is driven by the Coyote.
and he'll be safe. Um, uh, and as that sort of worn off, I'm not, I think, I think as situa the situation gets worse, deteriorates there, we'll see another wave. Whether we reach 90,000 now or whether there's another three months in there where the pause is driven by other factors other than the weather, you know, I, I don't know. But I, I, don't think, I don't think we've seen the end of it. I think, I think we'll see a wave, and then if that doesn't work out so well, then a few months later we'll have another wave as people keep trying. Um, still remains. I think we've established that. Uh, um, I just want to thank you guys all for coming. This is an issue that we will continue doing. We believe that it's very important uh, in the region. Uh, it's very important also that folks here in Washington continue being informed about uh, what's happening and what the implications are uh, regarding dealing with this. expert on the issue that we can always call uh, to uh, inform us and to enlighten us on this. So thank you once again, thank Doug. You. Thank you guys all for coming, and we look forward to seeing you at another one of these sessions. Thank you.